Hi everyone. Uh, my name's David. Uh, I head up the open source program office at BrowserStack. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about why browser engines are not the same as desktop browsers and are most definitely not the same as mobile browsers. Um, and so hopefully this knowledge is not to tell you you're doing it wrong, um, but to at least give you the ammunition you need to kind of make sure that you are, you are doing the things that you think you're actually doing, right? Um, and so I, I, I've got this knowledge. I've worked at Mozilla. I've worked on browsers. I've done desk, um, mm -hmm. automation. I've worked on Selenium for kind of most of my career. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll feel confident to be able to take it on. Um, so this is going to be my agenda. Um, we're going to go through a whole bunch of like different layers, and each is going to just build on to the, the next thing. Okay. Right. Um, so we're going to start with specifications. Um, browsers are incredibly complex tools nowadays. Um, for the best part of a decade, they've effectively been operating systems. We see this with like Chrome OS, Firefox OS, things like that. So they're incredibly complex, large beasts of applications. And so when we're doing our automation, we're doing things, um, we're doing it in the hope that the right thing is being done. And a lot of the, the right thing it comes from specifications. Um, and all specifications, effectively start at this one. Um, and so RFC 2119 has special words in it. Um, those are the kind of, at the bottom, the, is the main ones, uh, which are must, must not, should, and should not, right? So every time you see a specification uh, that a browser vendor is going to take and work with, uh, they'll read through this and it'll be like, at this step, it must do this. It must not do this. Um, and then sometimes it's got should. And should is a, a word that leads to interpretation. And then that's where we start to see bugs between browser, browsers, right? If something's got a should, they'll go, well, I like it this way. I'm going to move on. And we go there. Um, and if it doesn't have those words, then it's a free for all, right? Like people go, ah, I'll, I'll do the, the right thing. And so we get to the space with like moving on um, and getting into browsers and it starts to go all wrong. Um, so at least we know that like browsers are trying to do the right thing, but they're not always. Um, which then leads into like when we're doing our job, we want to kind of make sure that we're doing what users are doing. We want to be real, right? We want to make the right thing. Um, because as like quality engineers, estates, things like that, right? We want to be um, emulating the user as much as possible. But emulation is hard. Um, and so, We have like tools that do this, right? We've got Selenium, we've got Cypress, we've got Playwrights. Um, Hugs is probably somewhere around and he's got his robots that kind of do this real user testing. Um, but a lot of us is relying on what the browser has to do, has to interpret. Do we send messages that emulate things or are we faking it? And like there's a subtle difference here. Um, which I'm going to go into. Um, and it all kind of stems down to like what a document is in a browser, right? So a document is the page, how that is loaded. Um, a document can have multiple documents inside of it. Think of iframes, things like that. And you want to be able to interact with it. Now, when JavaScript runs, it's got this like event loop that runs in the background. It, like, you, you can inject into it, you can do whatever. Um, and then you have tools that go, okay, I can do this. I can fire events. 
And what they do is they fire off these events, and they go, like, the, I think, you know, it's just purely doing this. But they, the fire event is a case of 1 plus 1 equals 3 for your end users. Because if you're now trying to test your uh, login, logins, right, you've got to make sure that a real user could do it. Because the minute someone can inject JavaScript to fire events into logins or things like that, stuff that's supposed to be really, really locked down, like a real user would, um, firing off JavaScript is no good. And we see this with some of the tools that are on the market. They'll do a click, and a click will actually just be firing off this event. There's no trust in it. And browsers are really clever nowadays, and they try to see if it's a real user, because they don't want people's data being stolen, being faked, um, or is it just injection? Is it a bot? Things like that. And so, obviously, we're writing bots to do stuff for this, but we need to make sure that we're confident in our users, and our users trust us, and anyone who's worked through compliance knows uh, that if you get it wrong and the compliance is wrong, um, lawsuits happen, and so we need to make sure we're safe. Right, so making sure that we can be a real user is good. And so this is where kind of the subtle differences are going to start arising. Um, so why does it matter? Um, like, we just need to make sure that clicks, typing, things like that are going to be absorbed into the browser, handled properly, so that we can get, uh, get things working. Um, but we know this is not always the case, with, especially when it comes to things like headed browsers or headless browsers. For years, people have like, said, well, headless browsers is the way to go. We need to just test it. We can get our confidence, move on. Um, it'll be simple. Unfortunately, um, headless browsers for the last five years at least have been not the browser you think it is. And the Chromium team have never kind of made it public until recently, where they said, oh, by the way, we've got a new headless in Chrome. Because it turns out when you used headless in Chrome, you were not using Chrome you were using a different browser. And so people were going, what? Like, how, how can this be true? Um, Firefox is slightly different. Like in Chrome, uh, they had two things where they were like trying to emulate it. The way Firefox do, does headless is, um, and this is kind of where people get really frustrated with Firefox and headless, um, always needing a window manager, is that it just kind of makes the window invisible, so that it's still rendering, uh, it's still kind of creating its display lists, injecting it into the operating system, and rendering. But in Chrome, they were like, YOLO, what, like, let's just make it work. Um, and this was pushed by the puppeteer team, right? And the, puppet, the playwright team used to be the puppeteer team, but then they moved to uh, Microsoft. And so it was really, really pushed. And we lead to situations where Apples are not apples, oranges are not oranges. And it's important that we understand these fundamental differences because like, if we are making assumptions and we're trying to push things out and things go wrong and our like, direct, uh, engineering directors, CEOs come to us like, why didn't we test this? It's like, well, we did, the test passed. Look, I can show you. But you've been testing apples against oranges because that's not what your users are using. But so we need to know these, these, these things. Um, which then leads to kind of slightly different conversations. <coughs> what about browse, browser engines versus real browsers? And so in this case, I'm talking about like Chromium versus Chrome, Brave, Vivaldi, Opera. 
I think I looked up the other day. There's um, 15 browsers based off Chromium nowadays, and so if you look at it, how they act, Brave acts very differently on websites than um, Google Chrome. It, it just does, because they have different ideas around security modeling, um, what, what to inject where, things like that. The rendering is m like the same, mostly, but the way you interact with the browser is very different. And so trying to know where that, those differences is going to be really important so that we could do it. <clears throat> There's a, a story of a, um, it's, not, it's not public, so I won't name the company, but there was one company who kind of decided that uh, they would emulate, emulate Safari uh, with Chrome before Blink. So this is many, many years ago. They did this. Um, turned out there was a huge bug um, and it cost their customers hundreds of thousands of dollars. They then sued that company that was creating the software and lost. And like, because it's been made quiet, um, like no one ever knows it, but this is a, such a big thing that they then had to re-architect all their infrastructure to get it in. And like I say, all of those browsers act differently. The way they handle cookies acts differently. Uh, because like Brave, they don't want any types of cookies getting in. Google Chrome, they want all the cookies getting in because they want to track you everywhere, right? And those are subtle differences that not everyone fully appreciates. They go, well, I've run my test in Chromium. It works. <clears throat> And the same with Safari. Um, people make the assumption of like, and, and this is kind of like, none of this is a dig at any of these companies, but like with Safari, people complain, well, I can't use Safari because I don't have an Apple uh, device, which is a valid thing, right? Like Apple devices are expensive. Uh, not everyone can use them. Um, and so people go, well, I'll just use Chromium. It's mostly the same. Or I'll start using WebKit. And then we see really, really um, large testing frameworks nowadays telling everyone, WebKit is Safari. This is good. But it's not 100% true. Um, again, like, it's these subtle differences that kick in that really, really hurt people. And so, I'm just going to put this one up, have a drink quickly. Apple um, broke IndexedDB uh, two years ago, 18 months ago. Um, IndexedDB, for those who don't know, is kind of used as a like internal uh, database on your in your browser, so that if you want to kind of store things, they can kind of uh, persist a little bit longer. Uh, you can use it. It's really useful. Uh, people use it in um, like session management, things like that. Now, so this was broken in Safari, but if you went and tested the code that was broken in Safari in WebKit, everything worked but WebKit and Safari are the same thing. These are the types of bugs that kind of, kind of break websites, break your trust, your users will no longer have trust in you. And this is where kind of the, you'll start to see the belief uh, from some developers that we should have a monoculture out there. But if we had a monoculture, like if, you know, if this bug hit, Chromium, right? Like Google Chrome, the, the, this breaks, but in Chromium, it's fine. Again, right? There's, that's 90% of the market where people are going, well, I can't use this. 
and where monoculture really, really breaks us. Uh, this one, I was kind of speaking to um, Christian Broman, the web, web driver IO um, creator, and we were talking about like different things. Um, and in this case, um, WebM files don't work in Playwright's WebKit, but it works in Safari. And we start seeing kind of these like little bugs start creeping in where people make these assumptions. And now if we go back to like this situation and you put it into headless mode because you're thinking everything's working, you might not actually see those changes happening or kind of things like that. You need to sometimes see your tests running and see that they're working to have confidence in them. And in these cases, you know, it works in Safari, but not in WebKit. So a reverse of the other thing that I was talking about. And these are the bugs that are kind of really irk me and why I think people should be more confident in looking at the um, types of um, browsers that they're using to try and emulate those en what end users are doing more. Um, and this one, <coughs> And by the way, I'm not trying to bash Playwright. I think that some of the th ideas that they're doing is really good. But this one is a case of a uh, shared array buffer. It's used heavily in like WebGL, WASM, things like that, which is really, really growing. Um, they've turned off shared array buffer um, code in the Playwright's browser, uh, WebKit browser. It's been working in Safari for over a year. So the Safari team has supported it. They really care about it. They see it to move forward. But if you need it uh, in Playwright, in WebKit, you can't use it. You need to use a, a real browser. But that becomes a bit tricky. Um, so yeah, like just being aware of these types of differences. Like Cypress has, is always using Playwright's WebKit uh, for kind of testing Safari. But again, it's not Safari, right? And so we then move on to <coughs> mobile, because we know that like we've already seen that desktops are different, and this is where, like on mobile, that complexity in how operating, like browsers are operating systems really kicks in. Because the way browsers are effectively designed is to make sure that whatever is happening in the operating system, you never have to care about. You have this one API that just kind of magically works across everything. Um, but it doesn't always, right? Because it's software. Browser vendors try their best to do things. Um, I'm sure that we've, like, especially because of the pandemic, a lot of people started moving to mobile devices uh, to kind of do like shopping, banking, what, whatever, which led to kind of a huge rise in device device usage. Uh, I'm sure, like, people in your testing, yeah, you're trying to work with like you know tens of different. Uh, phones, different devices, screen sizes, things like that. I work at Browsers Deck. We have entire device farms that we kind of loan out to people. Um, and when you like look at the list of like, what device do you want? It's just huge because that's what we've seen from our marketing, like what people want. Um, but then like people go, well, it's just a browser, right? I've got this single API. Everything else should just work under the hood. Um, so yeah, the other side of it is that mobile devices are really expensive. And mobile front-end um, development is super hard. Like, if I make a website, can I test it? on a real device? 
is hard, right? Like development is hard in those spaces. We've all got on like nice um, laptops, bigger screens. We get used to kind of being able to do things. Um, but as I said, it's really, really hard to do this. Um, but thankfully, browser uh, vendors have dev tools that allow us to go in and recreate those situations. They just resize the browser, or like internally, they just like shrink the window um, so that you can do it, so you can see all the forms, things like that. But that's good enough, isn't it? Not really. <laughs> it's, it's not. Um, sorry. Um, resizing a desktop browser is not mobile. The reason for this is that, like, if when you're on a desktop browser, you resize it. Uh, the way browsers work is that, like, you get your CSS, you get your JavaScript, and it kind of creates all the way the browser, like, the page should look. That then goes down into the operating system. It creates what's called display lists. Um, and it does it for all the different layers in a page, sends it across to the operating system, and the operating system goes, don't worry, I've got this, I will render it for you. Um, the way mobile devices work, it does that too, except mobile devices need to care about battery life really, really do need to care about battery life. And so they try to do things slower, move things um, in different ways. Um, and they create situations that people don't always see when they just shrink the browser down. For developments, it's really great, right? You can just do this. You have the confidence that you, what you're seeing is correct, but you don't see any of the kind of potential problems that are hiding under the surface. You don't see the, like, oh, this is going to take a minute to render because I've got a really beefy Mac or, like, a really beefy uh, ThinkPad that kind of just makes things work really quickly, right? And suddenly, you create these situations. Again, like, uh, with just pure JavaScript, right? You try to execute some JavaScript. You're now making the assumption that the JavaScript compiler on your desktop is exactly the same as the JavaScript compiler on, um, on the phone. Browser vendors try their best to hide and obfuscate like, all the major problems that could potentially arise, but it's software. Software has bugs, right? Um, And I came across this one when I was looking through it because I, I like looking through people's bugs. Um, device pixel ratio is kind of important so you can see like uh, what, how, how the phone is rendering things, things like that. Um, and this is a beautiful bug. I, like I think the person who wrote it is, like wrote a really good one. Um, and the, the case here, it's like, it's all the things that I've been talking about above. So it's uh, headless, it's got a second screen, and then they resized the browser, and they were like, well, this hasn't worked the way I was into anticipating. This is a bug in Playwright. I don't think this is a bug in Playwright. Like, yes, it's like it's got all the, like, they're doing Playwrights, but the problem is, is that they're trying to emulate mobile on, real, on, a, um, on a desktop, and that just doesn't always work, because now they've like, created these display lists, the browser's doing things, magic, and it's like, oh wait, actually, my page is not rendering the way I wanted it. Um, and so there must be a bug. Again, I, I, this is, I don't think this is a playwright bug, but it needs to be sorted by them. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
And so all of this comes down to risk management, really, right? Like, because we have these huge, um, like, setting up device farms, setting up um, Selenium Grid is non-trivial, right? This is why companies like BrowserStack, Source Labs, and that exist, because you want to be able to just do your job. The thing that, like, I re that I really liked uh, from Mark's talk earlier was that, like, the amount of work that we need to do as testers that's not testing related is huge. We have the DevOps that we need to do. We need to set up the infrastructure. We need to do this, that. The next thing, build out all these tools just so we can actually do our jobs. And then we'll, we'll have the complaints from people. It's like, so why aren't you assuring, assuring quality? That's your job, isn't it? It's quality assurance. And I was like, no, I've got to do all these other things. And then you start getting these situations where there are these su subtle, hidden bugs in the way that we treat, do things because we've made certain assumptions. And it's not our fault that you know, we made these assumptions because they, sh they should be very valid assumptions. But setting up these things, making sure that we can kind of work through these situations um, is important and understanding it. And so the thing that I'm hoping that you will take away from today is that at least when you look at these situations, just go, if I run this in a real browser, does it work? Do I run it in Chromium now? Does it still do the exact same thing? Okay, I can trust it there, right? Um, I'm a big fan of kind of test-driven development mostly because I want, uh, I don't trust a test that I've never seen fail. Because it's important to know and understand it and move on. Um, and I know that like, you know, I, I work on Selenium, I work on Nightwatch, uh, which is a JS framework like WebDriver.io. Um, and sometimes setting up these things is hard. And I get it. And I, th and I hope that like, you know, when you look at tools, things like that, just seeing that you can kind of break it down, get that confidence in what it's doing, how we're doing it. Because like, you can test with WebDriver on real devices. Like, it's, it's not that hard. There's, there's like Nightwatch, we've got a tool that sets everything up for you. Um, and you can just work with it. But some people don't always understand it, but we, like, just kind of understanding those risks being able to write them down, and then confidently going forward from there. Um, and I think that's it. I think I've kind of zoom, zoomed through some parts. I've probably missed out certain things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we can come here to Q and A if people have questions. Okay. Thanks, David. So uh, we're open for Q and A. Uh, wait for me to get you the mic. Thank you uh, for giving this presentation. Um, I was just curious, so you, talk, you talked about um, using the browser for testing mobile stuff. What about emulators? Are they close enough? Or what dangers do they have in testing on a real, in comparison to testing on a real device? So yeah, that, that's the, the part that I was missing in my talk. So <laughs> thank you for bringing it up. Um, emulators are, again, it's, it's a risk management thing. So like uh, for Android, um, the way the emulator tries to work is, um, for those who don't know, is that it will try uh, replicate like all the way down to CPU instructions, right? And then everything should work. And those, I think, are is good enough for most people, um, because if you start using a real browser on an emulator, you can do it. The caveat with that is that you will not catch any potential performance issues or things like that. And then there are still some subtle bugs where you have, um, I'm trying to think of a, so like when I worked on uh, Firefox for Android for a bit, getting all that testing up, um, there were a lot of times where kind of the, uh, it would work in our emulators, and the main reason why, like, at that point we were using emulators is that, like, 
you do a push into the tree um, and it would kick off like a thousand um, hours worth of compute, type, like building, testing, things like that for every push at that point. I think nowadays it's about 3,000 at, at Mozilla. Um, and so you, there are subtle bugs where like performance you're not going to catch. Um, some things where uh, like Samsung devices versus Pixel devices can be different in the way because like Samsung take Android, they change it and they put it on the device. Um, Google do the same, right? And so there can be these subtle differences and then it's down to like hardware changes where like I say, JavaScript engines, um, renderers, they try smooth over as many of these bugs in there but they don't always do it. And so you could probably get there. Uh, iOS, uh, iOS that does a simulator, doesn't go all the way down to those things. Um, again, you could probably get away with it, but you're not gonna catch performance issues um, or, um, and like the nice thing about Apple is that they control all the hardware. So like they know that this is always gonna be the same all the way through um, and you, you'll get the same type of rendering issues. Uh, the, um, the one thing that, like, I forgot to bring up with this one. Um, this bug, uh, it was only in desktop Safari as well. Mobile Safari worked. WebKit worked. Desktop Safari broken. Because these are the types of different... Um, because everything's different. Even though it's got the same name, it, like people write the same code, it goes in, but these subtle differences underneath break stuff. And so yeah, this, this one, um, Web, WebKit, iOS on uh, mobile, worked, desktop, Safari, absolutely broken. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, other questions? So by doing all this, I get the sense that you've really seen some of these intricacies all the way through to their bitter end. Um, is there one that either was your favorite to discover or one that kept you up at night the most? Um, so the one that I've, I've kind of always got really annoyed by is the headless one. Um, for years, I've been telling people not to use headless. Um, on de like if you're doing developments, I get it, you don't want your like, screen being um, messed about, and so that's, like, if you're doing development, do it fine, but the minute it goes into your infrastructure, it should never be headless, ever, because those are the times where it was, and the main reason was because when I looked at the Chromium code, and I was helping the Firefox headless team, and they were like, oh, we could do it like Chrome. I was like, well, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? They're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work. Um, and so that's why they went down the route we did. So yeah, headless is the one that I kind of spent years and I was like telling people, no, you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it. And they were like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And it's like, but it's not the same browser. It's literally like, yes, it's his Chrome, but it's not the same browser. And so there was a lot of like people complaining, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, my, my thing for like the Chromium team is they hide certain like web driver APIs in headless mode only now. So like you can print with a uh, web driver. With Chrome, you have to switch it to headless. But then you also now know that it, and, uh, until like the beginning of the year, it was, um, it was never rendering the same. So like how do you know it's actually doing this, the right thing when you're printing it? Hey, David. Um, quick question. So you mentioned several areas in your talk that might be you know, particularly risky, you know, like this uh, device pixel ratio, the headless mode, and so on. Yeah. So would your recommendation be for people to focus on cross-browser and cross-device testing for any specific areas of their applications, of the systems? Or would you recommend doing you know, cross-browser and cross-device for all the possible scenarios they have, just in case? Um. I think it's, again, it comes down to risk management. Um, so I do think people should be doing um, cross-browser testing 
as much as possible. I also understand doing cross-browser testing is expensive, like super expensive. Like just if you run your own grid, just having an AWS bill for kind of running it is expensive. And so um, the way I've kind of spoken to customers and things like that is like look at where your traffic is coming from um, and then try model how you do that from there. And so you go like, well, I might do um, all my testing in Chrome for kind of like for this part of the pipeline. The minute it hits this pipeline, it goes to everything. And it, but it's like you know, like I say, when I was working in Mozilla, we had you know twelve different ways of Android that we needed to test against. That becomes super expensive in the cloud. Um, and we were, and all we were doing was emulation because we couldn't get to device farms. Like you can't, like Google and like Mozilla and uh, Apple, they can't just like go to a browser stack or a source labs and go, hey, can we have these devices? By the way, we're going to take all your infrastructure now because that's how much we need. Like so, it's a, it's a balance. But I think kind of just like look at where your data, like look at the data and then model it out from there. Okay, one short last question if you have here in the front. I think it's interesting to uh, use the analytics to see what to test, but then isn't this like a chicken and egg? Yes, it if, is. If, if we don't support Safari because we don't have users, we won't invest in. Yes, so yeah, no, there's definitely uh, a case for that. The, um, the like when I, talk about the like data of things like that. I always um, kind of um, am reminded of a, a story uh, from a friend who worked at Microsoft. He's been working at Microsoft for like 20 years. Um, and they created all the data and they looked at like, I think it was for, I think he was working on Word, like Excel or something like that. Um, and they were looking at the data and they're like, this, this is great. Got all this telemetry coming in. We can see how people are using it. They had an off by one uh, bug in their telemetry. So they said, oh, this is the thing that people really are using. We need to make sure this is it. No one was ever using that feature. There was the feature above it, but the telemetry was wrong. Again, so like this is like collecting data is good, but um, making sure that you're where your users actually are and you can get that by speaking to them is kind of useful. But the, the main thing for me is to like, try just be where your users are. Make sure they're happy and then go from there. All right, thank you very much for the insightful talk. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we will have now a short recess, but give it up, please, for David. Thank you.